thank you so much that you're our God. Thank you so much that you have done a wonderful job of making this world. And Lord, what we see are kind of the scraps around us, but there's still beauty there. Even though we have a world that has been damaged by lots of years of difficulty, peril, uh, sometimes even destruction. And Lord, we pray that tonight we will gain insight into origins and into what you have in mind for all of us. Thank you that, uh, Lord, you have made this world. And thank you uh, that you've made a lot of beautiful things and we enjoy them daily. We pray that your presence will be here and bless uh, Pastor Stan Hudson as he shares with us and we just pray you'll give him insight and understanding and that each of us can better learn to know you in Jesus name amen I was wonder, wondering if we should introduce this man as Dr. Hudson or Pastor Hudson but Stan I have known you as a fellow pastor and so I'm going to introduce you as that. Pastor Stan Hudson has had a lifelong love of studying the things that we find in science, in, 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 in paleontology and archaeology and, and, and geology especially. He has brought with him a wealth of knowledge and experience in that area. And uh, we have known each other for at least 25 years. And uh, he actually started the Creation Research Institute, is that correct? Creation Study Center. Creation Study Center yes. at our union office. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has even brought with him a, a, another, uh, a, 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 well, he's brought us Dr. Clendenin. Yes. yes. <laughs> Dr. Cle uh, Cedric Clendenin is a a, a new, uh, a brand new. Uh, uh, I hope I get this right. Paleo paleontologist. Paleontologist. Yes. Yes. And uh, so, if we have questions, and I don't know how you're going to do that, whether you're going to have a question time or not, but at some time, I know you will. And so I'll have to determine whether these folks are smart enough. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Pastor Stan, we're so glad to have you here. He currently lives in the Boise area and he has come here to be a blessing for our churches okay. this weekend. Um, I think it would be appropriate to give him a, 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 a hand. Would you? People usually clap when I'm done, if you know what I mean. So anyway, <laughs> okay, uh, good evening everyone. We're so glad that you came and you risked a little bit of the, the weather. We've kind of been dodging some storms and things. Yeah, so you. you can't see me. Yeah, but if I go over there, I can't see you. <laughs> but anyway, let me try. Yes. I forgot something. Oh, what did you forget? I A check? I forgot to turn my mic on for one thing. Oh. I forgot to tell people there are a few more of these available at the back table if you want. This card has our program for tomorrow, or the plans, the schedule for tomorrow. And so if you want to grab two or three of them, if you have somebody you could give them to, please do. I'll take it. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I got to see what I'm doing here. Yes. Anyway. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, uh, I have been a pastor, but I'm from Los Angeles. Sorry, sorry, no, that doesn't help. But, but uh, yeah, good people, good place to be from. I was uh, wanting to be a scientist uh, all my young life, and I wanted especially to be a geologist. I love rocks, still do. When people are walking through the mountains, they go, oh, look at that, look at that rock. This is me. Look at that rock. Ooh, look at that rock. I love rocks. And uh, my love of rocks got me into geology. I went to UC Riverside back in the day. And uh, I was a little surprised. I had kind of a weak, boy, how are we doing? Where should I stand? Back? Yeah, you think so, huh? 
Ring, ring, ring. Um, anyway, um, I went to UC Riverside, has an excellent geology program. And uh, while I was there, I had kind of a weak at, uh, weak Adventist Christian background, very weak. My family didn't go to church and, and, and so on. But I kind of thought God was probably there. But nevertheless, I wasn't a Christian, not even close. So uh, when we went, started to go to these classes and I listened to my major professor, one day he said this, Tonight we're gonna to have a creationist lecture, a guest lecture come and speak on campus. And, uh, <laughs> and he chuckled about it. And I thought, oh, okay. And then he said, well, you know, um, he looked like he was embarrassed that he chuckled, shouldn't have done that. Uh, he said, you know, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I believe in God. And so for the rest of the period, we wanted to know what he believed. Where do you put God in the picture? Because as I listened to him discuss what he thought about God and where he fit, I finally had to ask my question. I said, so, doctor, are you saying then that nature was sufficient to make everything we have and organize it into what we see, and then this being across the universe came and looked at our planet and said, they're gonna need a God. I think I'll go off for my services. Because the way he put it, God had nothing to do with it, and yet there was a God. And I thought, no, how, how does that make sense? That was very illogical to me. And I remember thinking, boy, if I'm gonna have any sort of opening for God, I'm gonna have to be fighting this system. And if I'm gonna do a PhD, which you really need to do in geology, back in those days you worked for oil companies, that was the only option. And I thought, well, where am I gonna get a PhD? And somebody told me, you don't have to be a born again Darwinist believing in evolution to get a PhD if you go to the University of Montana. Remember, I'm in LA. I said, who lives in Montana? <laughs> Man, that's just the sticks. Who would want to live there? Incidentally, I've given this talk in Missoula, and, you know, in Bozeman. Uh, anyway, so long story short, I dropped out of the program. I'm not sure what I wanted to do. And it was during that period of time that God came into my life in a wonderful way gracious way, forgave me, gave me direction, and said, Stan, I don't want you to be a geologist, I want you to be a pastor, and pulled me into that. But I never lost my love for science. And so over about the last 25 years or so, I've actually been doing creation programs on the side, and gotten friends with geoscience and all Melinda and the scientists that are in the denomination. I've done three uh, radio pro uh, television programs, and I have a radio program called Sing the Beagle. Oh, oh, okay, you heard of it. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Sing the Beagle, where this week we take a look at, okay, so you heard me. Anyway, so I've been doing that for 25 years, just uh, celebrate 25 years. Point is this, about eight years ago, the North Pacific Union Conference's president asked me to do full-time ministry in creation, and I, said, and I said, oh boy, just been in my church for nine years, so maybe they wanted to change. And I thought about it, I said, let me think and pray about it. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> so I've been doing this ever since. And during the COVID time, do you remember the wonderful days of COVID? Yeah. Uh, my bosses, my administration said, Stan, you're not going to go to a church. Can't go to a church. Can't go to schools. In fact, we don't even want you to come into the office. I said, okay. So stay home and look at your computer for months and months. So. Long story short, what came of that, and God led, is we produced a creation seminar that anybody can do. Uh, we have scripts, we have all of this. In fact, I, I told Pastor David, you know, you could have done this, David. But anyway, he asked me to come and I can't turn him down. So anyway, okay. <laughs> so here we go, and this is one of the segments called number four actually in the series, and this is the origin of the, of the oceans, and this is uh, about the flood. And so, right now, oh, is it on? Okay, we're having problems. Technical problems. Um, is it doing that? Okay, so I can do that, won't do the other. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm 
Was I pushing the wrong button? Could be. Anyway, all right. <laughs> Here we go. Let's talk about ocean, uh, origin of the oceans. We're going to talk about the flood. How many of you have given your grandchild or your child some kind of a picture or a toy that illustrates the flood, like something like this? Happy and, you know, and all this kind of thing. And boy, we're with animals, and how cool is that? Uh, the flood was the worst event this universe has ever seen. And there's not even a close second unless it's Calvary. This was a devastating event. Notice what triggered it. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and it was corrupt for all flesh. Please notice that, all flesh, all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to know the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. The thing is that those are inclusive terms that mean the animals as well. The animals were a problem like the people were, and the world was torn in violence. That's why God targets the animals as well as people. He could have targeted just the people if they were the only problem. So, incidentally, have you ever heard of stories of people finding the ark? Raise your hand and I'm going to just take a chance I can see you. Okay, there you go. Okay, there are a few hands up. We have heard almost all conservative churches, not just Adventists, but other conservative churches through the years have heard about stories, supposedly anecdotal stories of finding the ark. Now, Mount Ararat, and it says literally in Hebrew, that the ark came down in the mountains, plural, of Ararat in that region. But there's a lot of places where we can imagine an ark uh, coming down. Well, um, if uh, you would really like to see the ark, go to Kentucky. How many of you have, has anybody here been to this yet? Okay, there's a couple of hands. I really think that for Christians, I know Kentucky's not on your vacation list, but boy, if you can go, this is really something. This is opening day of the ark experience in Kentucky. Full scale model of the ark. Largest wooden structure in the world, built at $100, $100 million to build this thing. Uh, but it is really something. The uh, bottom deck uh, has animals, you know, so, uh, not real animals, but animals in cages. And the second level has people, living quarters, and storage. The top has science. Uh, science support for the uh, for the flood, as well as the very back of it actually has a whole story of the fall of Adam and Eve all the way to the second coming of Christ. It's really beautifully done. It's a great thing if you could ever go. Um, it's not cheap, but go if you can. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, if I was a Bible skeptic, if I didn't believe in the Bible, if I kind of thought that all all that uh, art stuff is made up. I would be aware that the Babylonians had a flood story at least four or 500 years before um, uh, Moses would have written it down in Genesis. The 21st century BC, the Babylonians called it the Gilgamesh epic. And there was a Noah-like figure called Utnapishtim. And uh, the gods were angry with man and tried to destroy the world with water, but Utnapishtim was clever and somehow survived the water and, and you know, and, and there uh, repopulated the earth and so on. Uh, that's actually older, but you know what? The Babylonians weren't the only one with the story. In fact, uh, take a look. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Assyrians, these all had flood stories. Uh, let's go to Europe. The Romans and Greeks actually had the date about right. Uh, let's keep going to Africa, Nigeria, Congo. This is all pre-missionary contact uh, uh, tribes and so forth that had them, even pygmy. Let's go to Asia, uh, Siberia, uh, you know, Mongolia, Russia. The Chinese actually had characters that were reminiscent of some aspects of the flood in their writing style. Uh, let's go to South Pacific. Australians, of course, that's talking about Aborigines. Even the Hawaiians have a story, an ancient memory of the flood. Let's go to the Americas. And you have ancient tribes as well as little bit what we would consider more modern tribes. Ancients like Toltec and Inca, uh, as well as, are you kidding, even Eskimos have a flood story. One time I was at uh, the Smithsonian Institute uh, Museum of Native American History. Did 
you go there was such a place. And you go there and it's kind of the inside of it is kind of like a teep. It goes up and up and up and up to the top. I went up there, I was looking at some of the displays, and a woman came with a tour group that she was leading. Now she was a Native American. And she was talking about some of the things and she stopped and she said to her group, you know, my people, talking about her tribe, believe that there was a flood. You people do too, right? And then she said, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> and I thought, in the Smithsonian Institution, man, it's pretty cool that she could say that. Uh, yeah, with all these tribes, maybe there's something to it. And you know what? There's no memories of ancient hurricanes. There's no stories of earthquakes, forest fires, any other natural disasters. Consistently, flood, the gods were angry with man, trying to destroy him. But there's only one thing different about the Hebrew story, and that is God created a way of safety if people wanted to survive the coming judgment. That's the difference in the Hebrew story compared to all the others. Okay, so let's go. Do we have enough water on the earth to actually do a flood like that? The earth was without form and void, dark was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. First description of things going on in, it, in creation. If you were to take all the mountains of the planet, smooth them down, fill up all the valleys, and make the earth as round as a marble, you would have 5,000 feet of water circling the globe. There's plenty of water. There's no problem with there potentially being a flood. Now, for years, science, Western science, Europe and so on, believed that all the things they could see in the mountains and valleys all around them showed the last, uh, the last events involving the flood, or all shaped by the last things of the flood. And they thought that on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were opened up. Incidentally, that word can actually describe volcanoes as well, because the word fountain there doesn't necessarily mean water. It means stuff that shoots up, like this. That was a standard understanding of Earth's history for centuries. Everybody accepted the Bible story, and that seemed to explain what they saw. Then things happened in the universities. It always starts in the universities. Uh, in Western Europe, like this is Cambridge and uh, um, um, Oxford, the rise of secular humanism, which is a fancy way of saying atheism, rose in the universities. The Christianity that was in those universities declined. And uh, Europe now can be considered post-Christian in its culture. You follow? Uh, I'll just leave it to you to decide whether America is going down that or not. But uh, anyway, the decline of Christianity in Europe, and that changed everybody's ideas in science and so on. It used to be science was started by people who wanted to study about God by looking at the things he made. That was the origin of science. But people like this came along. Uh, James Hutton, he proposed uniformitarianism, which sounds like a church. First church of uniformitarianism. You know, sounds like it. Well, what uniformitarianism is simply this, that everything that's been going on uh, during our lifetimes and so forth, uh, you know, the, the rain and the wind and so forth, the erosion, has all been going on roughly at that same pace for as far back as we can remember. And so, not a flood, not a big event. So let me give you an example, Grand Canyon. We got the Colorado River cutting a, cutting a path down below. And then if you were to measure the amount of mud that comes out of the Grand Canyon in the Colorado, say, take it for a year, how much comes out in a year, take a look at the canyon, how much is missing, and that's how old it is, end of story. And they don't look at it any further than that. That's pretty well it, uniformitarian rates. That's become the standard understanding until somebody like this came along. Now, this is J. Harlan Bratz, the UW geologist, Seattle. And uh, this fellow took a look at Dry Falls in Washington. Anybody here ever been to Dry Falls? Okay, good, a few of you. All right, Dry Falls, he went there and he looked at it and he said, you know, this kind of looks, even though there's water down here, nothing's coming over the edge, and it sure looks like Niagara Falls with the water turned off. 
So it kind of looks like something happened in the past that's not going on now, which is a forbidden way to explain things. So anyway, he started talking to his fellow geologists, and he says, I think there was uh, some kind of mass of water that came over the edge of this sometime in the past. And they said, we don't we do floods. <laughs> but anyway, he said, well, I think something happened. He said, okay, where did the water come from? Good point. So he went upstream from there. That's where Dry Falls is. He went upstream to um, the Clark, Clark Fork River, and he actually felt that he found evidence that uh, this is Missoula area, and there was a lake in ancient times during the, the Ice Age. We believe in the Ice Age, I'll talk about that later. But the Ice Age formed a dam across the Clark Fork River and backed up water like this, so much water that was the size of like Lake Erie, a lot of water. And then, one day, broke through the ice dam and emptied out emptied out in a matter of one to two days and came right on down through Spokane <laughs> and right up the Columbia River Gorge and widened the gorge considerably. Some of the water came into the Willamette Valley, carried some rocks there, but all of this came rapidly in a matter of one to two days and severely changed the topography, including, including coming over the edge here. Now, uh, we used to live in Spokane, Spokane Valley. We lived on the side of a hill Whenever we tried to plant a plant in the ground, we kept digging up these round river rocks. There was no river around there, no creek, nothing like it. Where'd they come from? They came from this, this event. So this has now been called the Missoula Flood, and he tried to make his fellow geologists believe that something happened. 40 years of proof he gathered, 40 years. Took pictures of giant ripple marks that water left and so on. Finally, he got some of them to actually go here and take a look at it, and they contacted Harlan with this comment. Okay, Harlan, we're all catastrophists now. <laughs> you convinced us. And you know what he said, and he, and he found out, fortunately, he was still alive, he was an old man when they accepted it. You know what he said after that? Now we need to look at the Grand Canyon, because he feels it was made quickly. Well, how many of you were around in 1980 on that Sunday morning? And some of you may remember because you're not very far away from it from here. When I'm looking out my office window, I can see, and incidentally right now it's gorgeous, just a big white thing, just like Mount Hood. Oh, just beautiful. But it wasn't so pretty back in May 18, 1980. Mount St. Helens Blue lost 1,100 feet in a matter of a couple of seconds. Well, take a look. I like volcanoes for a lot of reasons. Sorry, I'm weird, but I, I like volcanoes. I like to study them. Think of volcanoes as, well, first of all, what's a volcano? It's some um, gas or liquid, a rock trying to get up out, pushes the ground up, makes a mountain, that's a volcano. So when it comes out, think of two types of volcanoes. One with a top on it that has cracks in it, and it's easy to break through. And so that's the Hawaii uh, um, volcanoes. So lava comes up and Hawaii comes through one of the vents, cracks, flows down into the ocean and makes more Hawaii. That's a very good thing. Um, then there are other volcanoes who have tops on them. They're like quartz, no cracks, and they just build, they just hold the pressure. And so Mount St. Helens was like that. And if you think about it, toward the end of Mount St. Helens, before it erupted, the north face was about bulging out like this because there was gas trying to get out. And kept pushing the north face up to where five, five feet a day started pushing it. And then there was a little bit of a tremble, uh, tremor, tremor, tremor. <laughs> and actually broke free and slid down. When it slid down, that was what you see there. You can see this used to be at the top and it broke free and slid down. It's now sliding down. As it slides down, bam, it's the cork off the bottle and pow, out it all comes. There was, I think, 56 people that were killed in that eruption. About seven of them were in unsafe areas, generally with permission. They were like scientists and stuff. But the rest were in safe areas. And the fact is, they weren't safe because this was a much larger eruption than they had predicted. 
Now, what we learn from Mount St. Helens, believe it or not, actually assists us in the subject of creation. And that is, we can make a Grand Canyon very quickly. This is a north uh, fork of the uh, Toodle River. This is also called the Little Grand Canyon. And if you look at these layers of rock, uh, these are all graded beds, and this has now become solid and rock-like. And yet the water that was coming from the snow on Mount St. Helens came down and carved this while it was still soft and made this little Grand Canyon. And this has happened in a matter of a few days and not millions of years. So take a look at the Grand Canyon and look at the layers of rock that's there. Take a look at these layers. Explain to me how you can make a layer like that or layers like this. Some of these are the size of counties. These are big deposits. How are they so flat, one on top of the other? Because remember, supposedly this represents a time when this was the top of the ground. But where are the little valleys? Where are the little indentations? This is flatter than Kansas right here. How in the world did that happen? And then there's another on top, another on top. How did all of those flat layers get there? And that's sedimentary rock. There's no explanation for this except water deposit. Only way it could get there like that. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that as we where's this? Monument Valley. Valley, right on the Arizona Utah border. And take a look. You can tell that uh, there that used to be the top of the ground. There's no question. So where did all of this stuff go? And it's not down here anywhere, and it's not even in the same zip code. So where is that stuff? How did it get so far away? Only way it can happen is a whole lot of water. And incidentally, evolutionists also agree on that. We would all call this a drainage event. So water drained off as the continents were coming up, and toward the end of the flood, the continents were rising, and by comparison, the floor of the ocean was lower. And so water drained off of the continent. Sometimes it got caught and then broke free uh, through a dam of some kind, natural obstruction, and it came out with force. And that's what happened here. And it probably helps that these formations were soft at the time still. And they got, uh, you know, but they say that things like this were formed, look at, because they think there's age between these layers and somehow forces uh, very powerful forces bent these rocks. Well, I think that these were all soft during the flood, and that's when there was the earthquakes and everything, uh, that, uh, and the earth movements that shaped these rocks. So when you do science, you always start with a question. You want to answer a question. If you start with a good question, you're going to probably do better science. When we look at the crust of the earth, we know water's been involved. What better explains what we're looking at? Something that was caused by much water over a little time, or a little water over much time, and it all has to do with whether you're willing to interpret, uh, not just uniformly, but also with a catastrophe as a possible explanation. Okay, class, we are back in school. What are the three basic types of rock? Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rock. Let's start with sedimentary rock. Think of sedimentary rock as exploded rock, or, or completely destroyed rock, re-cemented together. It's made up of tiny little pieces of something else and made into a solid mass. Sedimentary, made of sediments. Uh, um, salt is a sedimentary rock or sedimentary mineral. Did you know that? When you're sprinkling rocks on your french fries? Uh, but those are, but that's water soluble. That's kind of good. <laughs> it does melt in your mouth. Uh, so, incidentally, I've got to tell you this one. I'm chasing a rabbit now. Sorry, Cindy, my wife. She says I'll stick to the topic. Salt. Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. You know what salt is made of? Two things: sodium and chloride. Okay, so, uh, chlorine. So sodium and chlorine make sodium chloride. Sodium is explosive. If you were to take a piece of pure sodium, drop it in your mouth, let it go down your stomach, you'd, you'd be a goner. Chlorine is poisonous. You put it in your swimming pool to kill bugs. So take something powerful and explosive 
add it to something poisonous, put it together, and that's what you are. Salt of the earth. Is God a miracle? He can say, yeah, I'll still use you, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> I just think it's funny. Okay, igneous rock is uh, rock that used to be ignited. It was hot, and then it cooled into something solid. Lava is basalt. And then metamorphic rock is one of these two rocks that's been cooked into something else. Now, what's interesting is sedimentary rock is 75% of the rock we found in the world. And you have to use, whoops, you have to use water to make it. Take a look at the Grand Canyon. That's all sedimentary rock. You've got to use water to make it. It's all around us. Incidentally, why do creationists uh, that talk on these subjects always start with a flood, or often do, it's with a flood? Well, it's because the physical evidence for the flood is amazing. It's all over the world. You can't deny the physical evidence. It's hard to say God created the world in seven days and I can prove it scientifically. God said, let there be light and there was light. That's a faith statement. You can't prove it scientifically. You have to believe it. But, you know, the flood, that's another thing. And so if we talk about the flood and we convince people that the history of the Genesis account of the flood is pretty supportable by the facts that we see in nature, then maybe they'll say, well, and maybe the rest of Genesis is historical too. So that's kind of why we do what we do uh, with the flood. What is the Bible for evolutionists? It's not Darwin. <laughs> it is the geologic column, the layers of rock, because in, in it we have the inerrant history of the earth, right? The record is inerrant. Actually, I agree with that, but how you interpret it is everything. So, for instance, these are the periods of time that standard views hold. These are millions of years over here. This is life eras, early life, middle life, recent life. These are the layers that they've assigned to uh, these things, and they think they're millions of years, right? So uh, what's really interesting is right there at the Precambrian Cambrian break, which they would take to be about 570 million years ago, give or take. So uh, what's interesting is you have an abrupt appearance from almost nothing to everything, practically, and most phyla or types of critters immediately show up there. That's called the Cambrian explosion for life. Now, you would kind of think if you believed in evolution, you start off with one or two things that involves, you know, kind of into maybe 10 or 20, and then over a few million years, maybe other things. But right now, the, all we've got is fossils immediately showing. Now, if we believe in the flood, then we would say, bingo, that's where the flood starts. It starts to catch animals and, and plants and so on. So, now what's interesting is, for instance, we find things like trilobites at the very bottom layers of the fossil record. Trilobites, you ever heard of a trilobite? My goodness, there are trilobite nerds in the world. There are people that study them and love them and boy, they're, they're just big fans of trilobites. Now these are extinct things. They are anywhere from this big to this big. And they're almost like water cockroaches or something. Uh, they're the bug-like things that lived around the edge of water. And because they lived around the edge of the water, they'd be the first things covered up as mud is coming down from the mountains and makes fossils out of them. That's, that's the explanation. But what's interesting about them is their eyes. The, the trilobites have different kinds of eyes. Different species have different eyes. Some have eyes like fish. Some have eyes like insects. Some have eyes on poles, you know? <laughs> And all very complex, very complicated. And evolutionists have long, and from Darwin on, they've said, you know, it's hard to explain an eye from evolution. Because an eye is super complicated. And uh, what started it? Mm -hmm. Some animal had maybe a patch of skin that was sensitive to light, so they could kind of orient themselves a little bit to that. Now that patch of skin eventually evolved into a focusing uh, I, uh, yeah, 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 anyway, so, and in many cases too, hard to explain. So, anyway, uh, let's just go past this to this. Okay, listen up. If there is one science quote that you remember from this whole night, make it this one, because this is by Stephen Jay Gould. 
He, for years, was featured in every PBS nature science uh, program on evolution because biology professor at Harvard, and he was funny, he was articulate, gave good quotes, looked great on camera, bingo. I call him the Pope of evolution. Uh, anyway, whoops, what happened? Okay, here we go. So notice what he says because he's admitting there's a problem in the fossil record. And back when I was at UC Riverside, I was aware of this problem, and I noticed they didn't talk about it back then. This is what he says. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as a trade secret of paleontology. What's a trade secret? Is this something you go to the press and talk publicly about, or do you keep it in-house? You keep it in-house and talk to your peers about it, guys. We've got a problem here with the fossil record. <laughs> the camera's on. Oh, we have no problems with the fossil record at all. Boy, don't we ever. You know, that kind of thing, and that's what he's saying. He's admitting it, and he's saying there's an extreme rarity of transitional forms. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data, that's fossils, only at the tips and nodes of the branches. The rest is inference, guessing, not the evidence of fossils. Okay, what is he saying? He's saying this. Take a look at this uh, tree of life, shall we say, for our geology, for an evolutionist. So we start off here, uh, you know, half a billion years ago with life somehow starting, we don't know how. Uh, life starts here and then it breaks off into plants and animals without backbones, animals with backbones. We're up here with monkeys and lemurs because we look like them and therefore have a common ancestor. But here's what he says. We've got data in the fossil record. In other words, we got fossils, lots of fossils right here, right where the lemurs and the people and the monkeys and the horses and lots of horse uh, fossils, lots of dinosaur fossils. Here's what we don't have. We don't have anything along the tree the branch, the branch. We don't have any pre-horse, pre-bird, pre-dinosaur, pre-frog, pre-fish. You get it? We don't have any of those fossils. And that persists. The more fossils we find, the more the problem lingers. Here's somebody who knows all about this. He's talking about Darwin. Darwin said in his day, boy, we got gaps in the fossil record, but I know. We're going to find more fossils, and it's just going to go boop, 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 and fill up all those gaps. Here's somebody, an evolutionist, talking about the problem. We are now about 120 years after Darwin, and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We're finding more fossils. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. We have even fewer examples of evolution and transition than we had in Darwin's time. What does that mean? That means when we thought we had something good like a horse in evolution, starting off with a little critter with several toes, evolving into a big animal with a single toe, which is a hoof. So, you know, pictures in your textbooks and so on. That's how it is. Problem is we don't have fossils that line up like that. And the more fossils we find, the more that these potential uh, uh, changes uh, are proven, are actually disproved. And so he's saying this is a problem. Well, let's talk about a couple of other things. How do we even have fossils at all? How we, we have billions and billions of fossils. I just came from Tucson, Arizona. Don't you feel sad for me? Tucson, Arizona. Somebody had to go, you know, to this rock and mineral and fossil show in Tucson. And so we went down there, and boy, do they have fossils. And there are billions of fossils. Look at the fish in this. We have lots of fish fossils. How does that happen if it's a flood? Well, if you've ever had a fish as a pet, you know you can't monkey with the temperature. Uh, and there were volcanic actions like crazy going on. So a lot of these fish died around volcanic waters. And take a look, but take a look at this guy. I'm sorry, I know it's in the eye of the beholder, but that's a beautiful fossil. <laughs> That's a beautiful fossil. Look at the detail. It's really incredible. How do you make something like that? Here is a guy who's an evolutionist who's talking about fish fossils, and he says, the explanation of the origin of fossils by the theory of uniformitarianism, uniformity, 
and I wish it contradicts the fundamental principle of these things that nothing took place in the past that does not take place in the present. Today, what? Today, no fossils are formed. And he said, we all think that things continue on from the past same way they are now. And how can that be if we're not making any fossils today? So, how do you make a fossil? With water, lots of water. Generally bury it deep and uh, have some layers of pressure on it and uh, you'll have a good chance of making a fossil. And those things are not happening today. So, Ice Age, okay, now, I'm gonna show you a slide that took me all day to make. So when I'm done with this, I hope you show a little appreciation for the amount of work that I put into this. Okay, agreed? Okay, then I'll show it to you. <laughs> the Ice Age, I've got a list of scientists commenting about the Ice Age, and I can boil it all down to one thought. Here's a good example. Although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. They don't know what causes it. They didn't know what, how it started. Had to start with some event. But well, what would that have been? Problem, you need cold summers and lots of precipitation. So, because you want summers to not get so warm that it will melt or the snow. So here we go, are you ready? Here comes the work. <laughs> these are volcanoes out in the, around the edge of the continents. These volcanoes are in the water and what happens? They start to emit gases and ash and ash goes over the dry land and what does that do? That causes the, the rays of the sun to bounce off and this gets very cold down here, very cold. And because the volcanoes are heating the water, that causes more precipitation more, more water to evaporate, go up in these clouds, and then come down, thank you, I, I could use that, and come down onto the land in the form of snow. And then you get the ice age. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Trust me, there's no other explanation that I that I've remotely seen. Why do we only have the ice age in Siberia, in Alaska, the top of Canada, Greenland, in just a little bit of Europe, but not across the rest of Russia. Why was there no way ice age there? For one very simple reason, there weren't any volcanoes there. We got volcanoes around the coast of uh, America and Russia, around the, yeah, anyway, you get it. So that is why. Okay, so, hey, thank you. You turned me down. Uh, uh oh. Okay, so if evolution was true, what would we expect? We would expect fossil series showing transitions. In other words, here, let me give you an example. A mouse supposedly became a bat, and that's how we got bats. So, grew wings, okay? So somehow, and not, not all of them, just some of them. We still got mice, but like one of the babies had wings and off it went. So, um, you should find in the fossil record, if, if the, the, the idea of gradual uh, changes is the idea, then you should have a mouse, then a 90% mouse, 10% bat, then an 80, 20, 70, 30, 50, 50, then all the way up to, here we go, we got bats. Does that make sense? In the fossil record, you should see some of those changes taking place. We don't see that for any species. And if you don't see it for any species, that's evidence that the model that you're using is wrong. Okay, simpler life in deeper strata, uh, fewer species, and so on. Okay, let's, if creation was true, there should be a lack of transition. Stasis, what's stasis? Give me a definition of stasis. Stasis, stasis same, it's the opposite of evolution. Evolution is change, literally change. Stasis is no change. So, let me give you an example of why stasis is prevalent in the fossil record. Let's say T-Rex, let's go with T-Rex. Let's say T-Rex in the current model is like 73 million years to 65 million years ago. So let's say it had about an eight million year run using the, the modern ideas. Well, if you take a look, you dig up a 73 million year old one, you compare it to a 65 million year old one, and there is no difference. It's the same model. We don't have a newer looking T-Rex versus an older looking 
Does this make sense? So that's it. When you find it, you find that animal and it's consistent and then, yeah, we don't see them changing even, even a little bit. Well, I can't say never, but pretty much. Okay, let's keep going. So, but we got a problem too, creationists, and boy, if I don't say this in a mixed group, you're just gonna think I'm a Bible-thumping know-nothing, and which I might be anyway, but um, look, I have to admit that we got a problem with fossil order. Why is it that dinosaurs are pretty much only in two and a half legs? Why is that? Why are they not way above and way below? Okay, well, let's talk about it. And Dr. Clendenikin can probably help on this subject. This is close to when he got his PhD in. And that is footprints in the sandstone. This is a piece of Cocodino sandstone, which is from the Grand Canyon area. Now, my mind's eye, when I was thinking of the flood, ever since I was a kid, I thought, when I heard about it, I thought, boy, it must have been like a washing machine, you know, just churning everything and mixing it all together. And then when, when the water subsided, it just kind of made a mixed up layer, kind of a homogenous bunch. That's not how we have it at all. We have very organized layers. Why did that happen? Well, this may answer some of it. Dr. Leonard Brand of Loma Linda University actually did a study on the Coconino sandstone. What he was trying to figure out is, was the original model that evolutionists thought, a dry desert with no water involved, and some kind of lizard. Incidentally, this lizard-like animal had a footprint about an inch wide, claws, no webbing, no webbing between the, the toes. And so it seemed like it was a desert type of lizard. They, they have found no bones of this animal, so they're just guessing. But he said, I'm not sure, Dr. Brand said, I'm not sure this was done in a dry environment. Let me see if I can copy it and get the same kind of mounding at the back of the foot and, and see if I can copy it, what it would take to copy it. So he had a laboratory, he had a, a, a tank with uh, sand in it, took a salamander and said, you are my volunteer. You know, he kept walking. So off it did, it walked around on the sand. Dry sand would not leave a footprint like that. And he added some water. Still couldn't get it. He asked, well, our water? Still couldn't get it. And finally he got so much water in, that, in there that the animal was literally splashing as it was walking. And that did it. Now, take a look at this sandstone. You see uh, at least three animals all walking in the same direction. What are they doing? What do you think they're doing? They are going for higher ground. They are trying to walk away from the rising water. Now, what does that tell you? That means that there was time for animals to move. There were time for them to try to get to dry ground, obviously at a high ground. Obviously at some point they wouldn't have any more high ground and that's when they got covered. They would get covered with their friends, their relatives, you know, all the animals that lived in sort of that ecology zone, whatever was there, including the plants, likewise is floating up and so forth. So the point is this, this gave animals time to get to places and basically be collected, shall we say, or fossilized in groups. And, uh, that actually is a partial answer, but it, it, I think it does help. I think it does help. Let's keep going. Oh, I'm going to pass this video. Let's talk about the ark for a minute. Everybody's curious about the ark. When I ask kids just how big the ark was, you know what they say? Big. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was big. How big? What was, what was the measurement that they used? Cubit. What's a cubit? Show me a cubit. Okay, right, from here to here. That's if we're talking about people that are this height. I'll leave it to you to think about that one. <laughs> was Moses writing down original number from, from uh, Noah's day? Or was he using current numbers from his day? Can't prove it one way or the other. It's kind of fun to think about. But let's go with more conservative numbers of 18 inches roughly. And that would make it 450 feet long, which is, what is that, a football field and a, and a half long, 75 wide, 45 high, three decks, one and a half million cubic foot capacity. If you were to use modern train cars to load it up, how many would it take? It would take, are you ready? 
522. That's a pretty big capacity, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Good. <laughs> I think so. That's pretty big. And it says that pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to know and entered the ark. Now, okay, people ask me, you can't have all the species of the world in the ark. And they're right. You couldn't. There's tens of thousands of species today, maybe hundreds of thousands of land, of uh, everything land animals. You couldn't get them all in the ark. So that's true. I went to a lecture series that was done by creationists, and there was a, a speaker there, a biologist from Southern Adventist University, and he was talking about this issue. And he presented, I think, a credible argument to believe that it was not species or even genus or uh, up to, it was actually up to the family level. In other words, for instance, now this is a commonly understood one, but for instance, two wolves gave us all the DNA necessary to make dingoes and coyotes and foxes and dogs. And all the dogs, have you ever seen one of these Westminster dog show things? Where you see all the kinds of, that's a dog kind of thing, you know, all the different kinds of dogs. And yet, look at the variety that you can get, and they're still dogs. Okay, so you only need two dogs to make potentially all that variety, and the two dogs would be wolves. Uh, how about cats? Same thing, two cats. I'll have to tell you this story. One time I was down by Coos Bay in Oregon, and I was doing a series there uh, in the schools, and so I had a little time in the afternoon, I was driving around the countryside, kind of just seeing how beautiful it is down there, driving toward the coast. And uh, I came to, toward Bandon, and Bandon, uh, well, I saw this sign by the road that said, Hunting zoo ahead, and I thought, well, oh, what, you know, goats or something? You know, and I'm driving further and had pictures of lions, tigers, and um, okay. And finally, it said, largest petting zoo in North America. Okay, I'm pulling over. So, <laughs> went inside there, I got to hold a baby red fox. Oh, this little baby was all okay. cute. And a baby opossum, touch a black bear, um, um, a lynx, pet, petted a lynx. It was really cool. Do it sometime if you're down in the Camden area. Okay, but here's the thing. They had a one-year-old snow leopard. Snow leopard with a mile-long tail. Gorgeous animal, beautiful thing, but it was one year and one week old. And the handler said to us, sorry folks, by federal law, over one year I can't let you touch it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, demonstrate a few things with this huge cat. And for instance, it had a ball with a feather on it, and it was on a string, right? Stick, string, and was playing with this cat, and it was bouncing off of the walls and chasing this ball around like, and I said, that's a kitty cat. I know what a kitty cat is. That's a kitty cat. I've had a kitty cat. <laughs> so big cats, little cats, they're related. It's clear. A cat's a cat, so you need two cats to produce all of the things that we see in cats. And so the point is, after, after the lecture, I came up to him and I asked him, you have a rough idea how many pairs we would be talking about to pr produce that? And he said, seven, eight hundred pairs, something like that. I said, oh, you can get that on the ark. That's interesting. I have a theory about this, too, that's a good theory because you can't disprove it. That's the best kind. Here's my theory. For instance, let's talk about this, the vitality, the strength of the DNA that they had, the genes they had were powerful. For instance, uh, they lived how long the men, the women? How long did they live in those days? Eight, nine hundred years, right? So there's something they had that we don't have. They, they were superior in a lot of ways physically. If you take a look at the generations from Noah, he had a grandson named Cush. Cush in Hebrew means black. And for the rest of the Old Testament, you have Cushites talking about Africans. So there you have that part of the human race, of, whatever you want to call it, part of the families 
already are seeing the variety of the races coming within just a couple of generations of Noah. He had the kind of variety in his kids that he could do. I don't think we've got that today. I mean, we're older than to be 90, not 900. So drop a zero, right? But anyway, uh, so we're not the specimens we used to be. And I don't think the same thing, I think it's the same thing with the animals. I think that the animals that came off of the ark also had superior vitality and DNA and genes. And I think they can make a wide variety in their offsprings for several generations until they're like us today. Degenerate. So anyway, uh, that's my theory, and you can't disprove it. I'll bet you can. So just for the fun of it, let's have a big number. Let's have 8,000 animal genera or families, kinds. The Hebrew word uh, barabin is a very uh, unclear. It says kind. And they got together in their kinds, and in their kinds, we don't know if that's species or what it is. But anyway. Let's say there were 16,000 animals and they had food for them for a year. All of that would place in the ark and you know what? You'd still have over half of the ark empty. Now, when I ask kids a following question, they give a better answer generally, not always, but generally than adults. So I'll ask you the question. Why was there so much room in the ark? Hmm? Exercise, okay, There's a, there, that's an adult. <laughs> the, the kids get it. The kids almost always say there's room for more people. And that's correct. I think that's exactly right. There was plenty of room for people on the ark. Um, what happened to the evidence of pre-flood man? Why don't we have human fossils? And I don't care what anecdotal stories you've heard, even if we find one or two, we still don't know where the people went. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine? There was nobody in the home when God called on the hearts of people. And this is a tough scripture. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. That's a tough one. So what does he do? Notice what it says and in the Hebrew. It's a very strong word. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. That word destroy is a word that, let's say you're an Israeli housewife and you're cleaning the dishes at the, at the window there. You got the faucet and everything. This is what you do with the plate. You take what's on it and you do this to it. God says, I'm going to do this to man. Gone. <laughs> that's pretty well it. Gone. And uh, that's a pretty strong word. So, uh, the way I answer the question as to what happened to the people, I go back to that picture of the footprints. The footprints. Because if there's time for the animals to try to get away, what are people doing? They're trying to get away too, and they're getting to the highest places the mountains. And they get to the very top of the mountains and when the water gets up to them, what happens? They drown. Is there anything left to bury them deep in the ground and make a fossil out of them? Uh, if you are familiar with the book Patriarchs and Prophets, take a look and see the description where the writer says people got to the highest mountains. Some of them tied their children to animals thinking it would promote their chances for survival. And eventually they, of course, drown to the top. Now, as the waters are coming down, and incidentally, you know what, how long the earth is, is active after, after they get covered up? After it hits the time, highest mountains. Waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth and all the high mountains and the whole heaven were covered and the waters prevailed on earth for 150 days. So five months after the last mountain top is covered. And whatever human remains there might be, there's not much left after five months pounding waves. When the water subsides, what's going to be there? What's going to happen to them? If there's anything left, fish food, that's funny. Um, who knows? But anyway, whatever might be left is going to settle on the ground and uh, it will not be preserved. 
So that's my partial answer to that big question. Incidentally, what's really funny, let me show you this quote, we're getting close to the end. Why are there so few people in the world? This is by population experts who are evolutionists. They say, if, if we humans came out of Africa one to two million years ago, that's a standard understanding, there should be many more people today. In other words, you're walking down the streets of, of uh, Hood River and you, you should be doing, excuse me, pardon me, whoops, whoops, excuse me, because <laughs> there'd be more people. Uh, what happened to the human population, uh, corresponding genetic variation? That question is asked by population experts. That means you've got to come up with a hypothesis for an event that wiped out the vast majority of that genetic variation. Something caused the human population to drop drastically. When or how often that may have happened is anybody's guess. Possible culprits include disease, environmental disaster, and conflict. What do they say? They're saying, boy, I don't know, but sometime in the history of our planet, we got down to like eight people. What could have done that? <laughs> you know, that's exactly what they're saying. And so, uh, yeah, we have some ideas. Don't you want to be the kid in the class that read, oh, 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 I got an answer. Incidentally, what is this? This is Mount Everest. You know what we got up here? At thy rebuke, the floodwaters flooded, the voice of thy thunder, they hastened away, the mountains rose. You know what we got on that? ever? We got granite here, metamorphic rock there, but you know what we got up here? Sedimentary rock with fossils. And that's almost six feet, six uh, miles high. How did that happen? Well, since the, the mountains rose. Scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lessons, saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of things started, beginning of creation. Uh, this they willfully forget, creation and the flood. Yeah, I think we're kind of there today. Well, all right. I'm going to just skip that because that's going to be in the sermon tomorrow. Um, and so is that. But I'll close on this, this text. For as in the days of Noah, right? In the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the ark flood, the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So here's the thing. There's going to be, in the future, there's going to be a Mariners baseball game, and their star pitcher is going to be pitching, and everybody's going to be looking forward to that. There's going to be, um, there's going to be construction on the freeway, and boy, slowing things down. There's going to be somebody saying something silly in Washington, D.C., and, you know, and, the, and they're all getting excited about that, all the news organizations. There'll be a marriage that breaks up in Hollywood. Oh, man. Um, and then Jesus will come and catch the world completely by surprise, except for some. You ready? Why do I do this still, Pastor David, when I'm past retirement age? I do it because I care about people and I want people to be ready. Amen. The greatest evidence that Jesus is coming back, listen to me carefully, is the flood evidence on this planet. Because that show God judged the world before. And because he's done it before, take him seriously when he says he's going to do it again. This time with fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will all be ready for the great day Jesus comes back. It is going to catch the mass, vast majority of the world off guard. Everything will be going as normal. People marrying and giving in marriage, business things, the news will all be just the regular series we hear today. And yet, there will be the most amazing thing happen when Jesus comes in the clouds. That same Lord that said, I can't take a violent world any longer, is going to step in again and stop this craziness that we see in this planet now and take us to a better place. Lord, I pray that all those that are here today, as well as the ones that they care about and love, will be ready for that day. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.